get to our program in just a moment, but we wanna make sure that um, those of us who speak the language other than English are able to fully access this conversation. And so to start, we wanna have the Haitian Creole interpreter, Nikita, please introduce yourself and give instructions about how to access uh, your interpretation. Okay. Nikita, are you there? Yes, I'm here. I'm here. I'm Nikita. I'm going to be the Haitian Creole interpreter. I'm not seeing the sign yet, the globe. Yeah, Nikita, if you can explain in Haitian first, and then I will start the interpretation. Okay. Okay. Uh, my name is Nik in Haitian. Okay. Nom c'est Nikita. C'est moi qui ai interprété après midi hein, à soir. Hein. Nous avons un globe, on va qui tombe avec un globe. Les les noms et requêtes là, la première c'est nous veut interpréter, la checker French, la marquer French. Okay. Nikita, thank you. Okay. Uh, next, so here it is. Claudio, the Spanish interpreter. Can you please introduce yourself and explain how to access your service? Claudio, can you say that again? I don't think we were able to hear that. Yes, uh, you had me on interpreter, so that's why I couldn't be heard. Uh, muy buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Claudio Ruiz. Voy a estar haciendo la interpretación en español. Le pedimos disculpas por las dificultades técnicas que tuvimos al principio. Le pedimos, por favor, que si prefiere escuchar esto en español, escoge el botón. Si está en computadora, está abajo en el globito. Escoge español o si está en un uh, móvil, sería arriba en los tres puntos. Al, aplíquele ahí y ahí va a escoger español. Muchas gracias. Mario, thank you. Next, Manuel, uh, can we have you explain how to access your services in Cape Verde and Creole? Mi nombre es Manuel. Uh, Sou desculpa a nós, pois atrás não tive ali sim, uh, por causa de assuntos técnicos e não queria pedir tudo gente, uh, quem quiser ouvir na Cabo Verdeano, bota escolher coreano, porque que tem escolha em Cabo Verdeano, então vou ter que escolher coreano. E se vou colocar na tela, vou te calcar naqueles três pontinhos, bota escolher tradução e bota escolher Cabo Verdeano. Muito obrigado. And well, thank you. And finally, Brendan, our Portuguese interpreter, can you please explain how to access your services? Olá, tudo bem? É, a gente queria pedir desculpas pela demora. A gente teve alguns problemas técnicos, mas a gente está começando assim de verdade agora. Então, se vocês precisarem a interpretação para português, então vai ter uma opção, vai aparecer o globinho ou três pontos e vai ter que dar clique nisso e vai ter que escolher o português. Muito obrigado. Excellent. Thank you, Brendan. And thank you to all of the interpreters for your time and your service this evening. I want to note that tonight's discussion is being live streamed on Facebook, as well as WGBH's forum network page. It's also being recorded and will be made available for viewing after a discussion. Uh, tonight's program is being hosted by the Codman Square Neighborhood Development Council in partnership with the Fairmount Indigo CDC Collaborative. Uh, Dave Queeley, the Director of Eco Innovation for the Cotton Square Neighborhood Development Corporation is here. Uh, Dave, do you want to say a few words? Dave, you're on mute. Hi, thank you, Soraya. On behalf of our Executive Director, Gail Lattimore, uh, I'm Dave Queeley, Director of Eco Innovation of Codman Square Neighborhood Development Corporation. I want to thank you for taking the time to join us today and hear from our two candidates, State Senator Nick Collins and his challenger, Samuel Pierce. Codman Square NDC is a community development corporation based in the Codman Square neighborhood of Dorchester, whose mission is to build a better, stronger community in Codman Square in South Dorchester by creating housing and commercial spaces that are safe, sustainable, and affordable promoting financial and economic stability for residents and for the neighborhood, and providing residents of all ages with opportunities and skills to empower themselves to improve their lives. We've been here for more than 39 years, serving the residents of South Dorchester through our real estate development, 
community organizing and resident resources, economic development, economic development and eco innovation departments. All of our work is designed to help residents remain in place and help create a thriving and equitable community. With that, I'll turn it back over to you, Soraya. Thank you so much. Uh, we also have with us Sabah Ijadi, the Fairmount Indigo CDC Collaborative's Climate Justice Coordinator. Sabah, you want to say some words? Sure. I'll just quickly mention that uh, this forum is a part of our climate justice initiative um, you know, meant to empower voters to be more informed about the candidates uh, that they can vote for this September 1. And I'll be sharing my contact info at the end of the meeting. Um, and you can reach out to me if you would like to be involved in our grassroots advocacy campaign where we promote climate justice. Excellent. Thanks so much to both of your organizations for putting this forum together. And just now onto the discussion, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and condense the bios that we have in the interest of time. Tonight, we're talking with State Senator Nick Collins, who's been representing the district since 2018, and the challenger running to unseat him, Mr. Samuel Pierce, a Dorchester native and longtime Democratic campaign worker and volunteer. I'll be asking questions submitted by audience members who registered beforehand. I will also take moderator liberties and add a few. We'll take turns allowing either candidate to answer first. Each will have two minutes to respond. We've asked them both to address their responses to the moderator and not to one another. Uh, gentlemen, I'm asking you again not to speak over one another and watch the notifications that I'm going to flash. Keep track of time. Uh, and uh, forgive me if I cut you off. We have a lot of ground to cover within this one hour. Um, we're going to go ahead and let the incumbent answer the first question of the evening, which is. What's distinctive about this district and why should folks re-elect you in this case to represent it? Uh, thank you, Soraya, uh, Saba, Fairmont, Indigo, uh, Common Square, and WGBH for putting this on. Um, well, uh, the first topic is the most diverse in the uh, Commonwealth, both economically, uh, racially, ethnically. And you know, I think it requires somebody who can represent the entire district. I think I've proven over the course of my career um, from the House of Representatives uh, to my representation now that, that I can do that. Um, you know, we've done a lot of work in the last two years uh, on public education, with Chapter 70 reform, on economic development, equitable economic development, some that's before us now um, in the Conference Committee of Economic Development um, on, on uh, economic development equity, on environmental justice, on our work on the Fairmont line. Uh, so transit equity inter intertwined with um, environmental justice and um, some ideas that we built uh, from our work in the state that we wanna uh, push towards the city on, on housing and how to really achieve affordable housing, both in partnership, but uh, through advocacy, uh, building up some legislation that we've already passed at the state level. Uh, but most importantly, someone who understands uh, how to leverage the uh, government resources, whether it's state assets and spending or uh, re regulatory powers uh, to get what this district deserves and um, looking forward to completing our, our medical residency program that we're uh, uh, in the throes of establishing with the Kearney Hospital and the Department of Public Health to serve the diaspora across the first suffix. Excellent, we made it before time. Uh, Mr. Pierce, same question to you. What's distinctive about this district and why should folks elect you to represent it? What's distinctive about this district is actually it is the key to actually the Commonwealth. Um, it's the first suffolk, which means that it was the first district that they actually historically laid out when they mapped out the entire Commonwealth. And it also was formerly the seat held by James Michael Curley, as well as President John F. Kennedy. And so this seat is not only historic, but it also deals with the Harbor Islands. It deals with a lot of the history ever since the very foundation of our country. Since Massachusetts invented America, as Governor Patrick said, and obviously Boston is the birthplace of America. And so part of the reason what uh, makes Dorchester specifically uh, very significant is that both uh, the Collins family and the Pierce family have a lot of significance there. There's a Collins Street, there's a Pierce Street. Samuel Pierce helped uh, fortify Dorchester against the the British during the uh, rebellion. But this is all very historic. There's a 
Collins House, there's a Pierce House. So what really makes this district significant is it's actually the most diverse district, not only in the Commonwealth, but actually in America. Because on one hand, you have billionaires that live near the seaport. And then on the other hand, you have people that uh, make less than $20,000. Both finished before time. Excellent. Uh, I want to turn to the topic of police reform. The nation is reacting again today to footage of a black man shot by a police officer. This time it happened as many across the country, including here in Massachusetts, were already outraged and demanding changes to address racism and police brutality. Uh, Senator Collins, you took some heat when you voted down a bill that came before your chamber last month. You said in a statement that you were looking forward to voting for a package that brings about thoughtful and meaningful reform to address police conduct. What measures do you support to bring about those outcomes? Well, thank you uh, for the question. Uh, a number of them were in the Senate bill that I worked to get in uh, the bill with my colleagues, like the African American Commission, which would review legislation that comes out of the legislature, out of our legislative committees through an equity lens and determine its impact on the African American community. Uh, racial data collection that stops, all stops, not just stops that result in citations or action by an officer, uh, but most significantly, an independent review commission that would be unprecedented here in Massachusetts, and I think would, would uh, speak to bring about uh, the change and the, the justice-seeking change that um, not just Massachusetts residents and people in the first suffrage district, but all across America are looking for. Um, right now, we have a situation where uh, we don't have the ability to, de uh, to I'm sorry, certify and decertify officers based off their misconduct. This commission would be able to do that. Um, we would also be able to, uh, with subpoena power, uh, be able to investigate misconduct and uh, um, identify wrongdoing. And once uh, decertification uh, takes place, that there will no longer be a, a police officer. What happens? Uh, what has happened in other parts of the country, and, and you know, we're we're trying to ward against this in Massachusetts, is that. Uh, officers, when they have committed wrongdoing and gotten fired from their police departments, end up getting hired on others. Uh, that's just one example of what this commission would be able to do in bringing justice uh, for families that have been victims of misconduct. Uh, but I think the independent piece is key, that it's not just a, a committee that's going to handle uh, training statewide, which we know is important, but also have that independence uh, to investigate the subpoena power, misconduct, and make that determination whether this officer um, should be a police officer or not and, and, and get the justice that they deserve. Mr. Pierce, same question to you. What measures do you support to bring about thoughtful and meaningful reform to address police misconduct? I'm glad you asked that question. See, there's a lot of difference between me and my opponent, mainly because we cannot put a Band-Aid on issues. First of all, we have to acknowledge that we have 5,000 to 6,000 homeless BPS students. And if they're not able to read in the fourth and fifth grade, we know that they are going to be part of the cradle to prison pipeline that's gonna to lead towards incarceration, which is why I founded schools instead of prisons. The other thing that we also have to look at that's different than me and my opponent is that my opponent not only voted for qualified immunity, but he also voted for Senate Bill S-27, which is an act relative to children in care, protection, and custody of the Commonwealth. And it's a terrible bill, mainly because it creates a committee of state organizations that actually deal with child foster children. And 39% of them are now being put on psychiatric drugs. Um, and this is really a problem because as we open our schools remotely, we need to make sure that Kids are not just stuck on Ritalin, forced to watch a computer screen. We need to have outdoor classrooms where kids can run around, enjoy themselves, and learn about science, which is also why I founded Sports Equal Science, because they can actually look and research all the Boston teams, look at the statistics, find out a little bit about math, find out about a number of things. So part of the police reform that I would do is I would look at some of the CSO officers. I look at the gang unit. I would even look at Boston's Finest, the old TV show, and how they were able to play sports and collaborate with some of our youth. I would look at the fact that 
the GREAT program is no longer utilized and spoken about, but is actually the most effective police program that has been used it was federally funded, so I would use some state funding. And I would also look at the fact that we pay a lot of police overtime. So similar to the state police, I would make sure that there's GPS so that police are not just aimlessly going different places or doing things that are not uh, conducive to their job because people need the police and people value the police. Mr. So Pierce, that's doing. time. Thank you. Senator Collins, I'm going to give you a chance to respond here because we have a question from Melia who wants to know specifically, do you support diverting funds from police to other social services? And do you support qualified immunity? And please explain why or why not. Uh, sure. Um, so on the issue of qualified immunity, uh, the civilian commission, which would be in charge of decertifying police officers, is the equalizer when it comes to qualified immunity. In the Senate version, we had uh, some language that wanted to um, essentially remove it for all public employees when the discussion was around police reform. Uh, so that was the issue that I took with that. Uh, it, it took on a lot of other public employees that wasn't discussed um, in deliberation. So uh, that was a, a, a point of contention for me. As it relates to uh, resources for public um, for public health and other. Uh, I pride myself on having spent a lot of time advocating both in our budget and our supplemental budget uh, to bring resources, even just in our recent supplemental budget uh, to the part Department of Elementary and Secondary Education uh, uh, for a grant program for summer and out of school programs, uh, for community-based programs that support um, the enrichment for students that have been dealing with COVID-19 and have suffered the impacts along with uh, IT investments for uh, broadband access for a lot of students that we saw over the course of COVID-19 that did not have access to, to uh, high-speed internet. Um, and further for resources for uh, the City of Boston Public Health Commission for trauma recovery services, um, uh, youth violence uh, prevention and intervention. So I'm, I'm very proud of that effort and that record. Mr. Pierce, the same question to you. Do you support specifically diverting funds from police to other social services? And do you support qualified immunity? And please explain why or why not. So I do not support qualified immunity, mainly because I think that it has allowed people to misbehave and be above the law. And as the old saying goes, no one should be above the law except the king. We don't have any kings in Massachusetts. And so no one should be above the law. The other thing is that we need to remind our civil servants that that actually is what they're supposed to be, civil servants. People are supposed to look to the police for guidance, for help, for directions. And a lot of people do not feel as though they are protecting them. The other difference between me and my opponent is that my opponent said 10 years ago, he would have voted against healthcare. Now we have COVID-19. And so as I look at this pandemic, I look also at the fact that my opponent voted for Senate Bill S-244 is an act relative to mental health education. And the problem is that in a pandemic of over 9 million U.S. school children on psychiatric drugs and 19% of Boston public school students are labeled as special education, I am very concerned that as we reopen our schools, there is no one who's actually going to fight for them because I'm hearing one thing, but I'm also looking at the facts. And the facts are that I'm the only candidate that would not only uphold healthcare, but I actually would say mass health for all, because I don't think we can wait for the federal government to do Medicare for all. I think we can do mass health for all right here in Massachusetts, since we actually started healthcare for the nation. And it's the template that we actually created that the nation builds upon. And I would actually fund that by making sure that we dovetail some of our education expectations with realizing that we, we need to bolster our nurses and our doctors and our scientists. And all of these people could actually become interns. We can create jobs from this. And instead of funding pharmaceutical companies by allowing our kids to be drugged with Ritalin and all these other behavioral medications, I think that we can actually let kids be kids return recess to schools and make sure that kids are learning 
that while they're running around playing sports, there's actually physics involved when you dribble a basketball, learning that there's geometry when you use time. it. The next question for both of you comes from Magali. Research suggests immigrants and people of color with, within urban communities may be disproportionately affected by poor air quality. That can lead to higher rates of asthma and other respiratory illnesses. This is particularly concerning now that we see these communities are more heavily impacted by COVID-19 than others. As State Senator, how do you plan to address environmental issues like these in immigrant communities and communities of color? Mr. Pierce, you'll go first. Thank you. The first thing that I would do is I would actually create low-income housing with e-positive buildings, similar to uh, what has happened in Roxbury, where we would actually give more energy to the community and you would do two things because part of the problem was the US Homestead Act where the government actually became the slumlord giving up on a lot of our low income communities and our projects and our uh, housing developments. So the difference now would be if you do rent to own housing and tell some of these people just like how they retrofitted uh, South Boston and now because you're near the beach, there are names with congressmen, you know, the Lynch building used to be a public development, and now it is actually luxury condos. And so we need to make sure that, as uh, President Kennedy said, a high tide lifts all boats. We need to make sure that we have low income housing that's actually rent to own, similar to what you saw uh, when John Kerry, who became the Secretary of State, uh, spoke at Ashmont at the unveiling. And that building that was right there in Ashmont was rent to own housing. And our very own Ayanna Presley went from someone who rented a house to owning a house. And now she is the US Congresswoman. So rent to own housing does work. And we see model after model, example after example. And the other thing I would do is I would actually look at co-op uh, opportunities because some of our public housing facilities could potentially become co-ops. I look at New York and what they did with some of the military housing and retrofitting that into co-ops and making that rent to own housing. I would also uh, allow for land trust, just like DSNI has a land trust in Roxbury. I think that our uh, district is ready for a land trust in uh, South Boston, Dorchester and Mattapan. And I would pay for it with linkage funds because we have uh, over $30 billion worth of construction in Boston right now. And we have more on the way. And one of the issues has been- uh, Mr. Pierce, if you could wrap up your comments, that's time. Okay. One of the issues actually has been the fact that no one's been calculating the $10 billion in the capital budget that's going to go to South Boston to shore up our waterfront. So there's a lot of money right now floating around South Boston, about $50 billion when you really calculate everything. Uh, just, yeah, just to respond, I mean, some of the things that were said were just totally just untrue. Um, we can get into, you know, what's been put towards the bond bill a little later on in the discussion, and I'm proud of the the efforts that we've made. And one of them is around uh, environmental disparities uh, with a simple investment, trees. We have a, in the bond bill, we have uh, investment for trees uh, coming to Dorchester, Mattapan, High Park, and probably more significantly, um, the work that we're doing towards the electrification of the Fairmont line. I think that can't be understated. Uh, we're, we're trying to extend that all the way to the waterfront, but more importantly, turn it electric, uh, turn it into electric inside the city so that while we're increasing frequency and making it more accessible uh, to a residents for a lesser cost, we have a discount inside of Boston and also now with the uh, efforts, um, including the, with the Fairmont Indigo Corridor um, Coalition uh, to make sure that residents only get charged once and they can get charged with their Charlie cards so when they're getting on the Fairmont line, they can get downtown. If they have to hop on a bus or another train, they're only getting um, uh, charge once. So very proud of that record. There are no luxury condos in the old colony uh, housing development. Uh, they're all still um, uh, pu public housing managed by a, a private entity on the private management side, but uh, there's no there's there's no no luxury condos down there. On S27, that bill was an important bill uh, for for both uh, advocates for parents or children to bring transparency to DCF. Anyone that has uh, dealt with challenges with, with, DC, with DCF, and that was one of the first committees I served on in the House, knows how challenging that it is, particularly during COVID-19. So having that uh, 
transparency is critical and that and, that, and, and transparency is key. Um, and as it relates to our, our children, our students, um, our efforts to reform chapter 70, um, which we're gonna uh, initially only bring $2 billion, I'm sorry, $2 million a year additional to Boston after um, pushing back, uh, we were able to secure an additional 100 million additionally uh, through chapter 70 state funding for our Boston public schools to address those areas of trauma, uh, children facing poverty, um, learning disabilities, and, and other challenges that make uh, public education in our city more expensive. So I have to fundamentally disagree. First, I'm going to get back to uh, what your original question was. Mr. Pierce, we're not addressing our comments to one another. Well, we're staying on the topic of environmental justice and climate he change. Said he disagree with him. That was how he started his statement. Yes, sir. We are not making time for you two to address one another. Okay. The next question comes from Dave. The 2015 Omnibus Climate Change Bill includes goals for reducing greenhouse gas emissions, environmental justice protections, and plans for workforce development. This bill has been criticized by environmental groups who say it's not doing enough to, climate, to combat climate change. Where do you stand on this bill? And is there anything that you would add to it? Uh, Senator Collins, I'm going to ask you to go first and also keep in mind that the interpreters have to keep up with you. Sure. Thank you. Um, yes, so uh, I do support the bill. I do think it could be stronger. Uh, there are some pieces in there that I would like to see, given that this district is a coastal district all the way uh, from the Ponset River to, uh, uh, to, to the waterfront, that instead of having to negotiate uh, climate change resiliency, that we have a piece of legislation uh, that would I, I want, would like to see included in this uh, bill that would make it uh, mandate mandatory at the state level uh, when when plans are filed uh, of a certain size and, and that are inside um, uh, chapter 91, which is uh, you know within a, a small footprint of, of the waterfront. Again, that could go from uh, Hyde Park all the way to uh, South Boston. Uh, that that they're not negotiating that as a community benefit right now. That happens and the community uh, loses. We have climate ready Boston a proposal in front of us and that that should be a mandate for anyone that's looking to do development, um, not as part of a local negotiation. Uh, so at the, at the MEPA in chapter 91 uh, level, uh, that's what our bill is all about. And also, so not just in, in Boston, this district, but across the Commonwealth, there are a lot of municipalities that don't have a planning agency that can't uh, leverage uh, these issues on behalf of the public. Uh, and so having this done at the state level would also help other cities and towns uh, that uh, would have a difficult time, that are having a difficult time uh, bringing about climate change resiliency uh, across their uh, waterfronts. Um, and just to clear up another issue, uh, on, in, in 2010, that that was not going to pull back on um, any healthcare uh, benefits for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. We had uh, in 2006 healthcare reform that removed um, the ability of insurers uh, to ban anybody because of pre-existing conditions. And, you know, that was a lot of the land in 2006, long before 2010. So I just wanted to clear that up as well. So I'm just gonna jump in. So first of all, what I would do differently is I would make sure that we make sure that our idle traffic and as we're redoing Cummings Highway and looking at our roadways, that we're also thinking about people walking, so pedestrian traffic, and we're thinking about the respiratory ailments because COVID-19 is actually an aerosol. And so the problem is that because we don't think about the environment and how we actually breathe, we do need trees. But the problem is we don't have any linkage to the construction and some of the leaky gas lines that actually make it hard for a lot of our people in, in the first suffolk to breathe. They have a lot of respiratory issues, including the Arroyo family. Uh, Felix Arroyo, who was a former city councilor, actually had asthma due to the lack of accountability of people who are dealing with green energy and making sure that we get off of the natural gas. So what I would do differently is I would make sure our buildings are more geared towards electrified buildings. So we look at the LED, make sure that everything is lead safe and we make sure that everything is green. I would also look at the Fairmont line and make sure that we look at catenaries similar to the green line 
and what happens in Cambridge or electrifying the rail because we cannot continue to have gas powered trains and think that we're somehow helping the environment because that's happening in our neighborhood and the green line, which is in the suburbs is already electrified. They already use the Charlie card. So a lot of this sounds like nonsense. And the other problem is that currently Massachusetts has over 39% of its foster children on psychiatric drugs. So I don't see how the Senator is fighting for them because the DCF takes them away from families. So parents actually don't even have a chance to have a say. So that's the difference between him and I. I actually would uphold the community, make sure that families can have a say in their children's well-being and their education and making sure that when you walk around the city of Boston, it does smell nice. And we make sure that the construction is linked to how many trees they're gonna have to replant. Because if you take away one of our uh, sidewalks and put in a driveway, you're usually taking away a tree as well. And there's never been a plan. Can you wrap up your comments? That's time. Yes, thank you. I'm done. Last week, the Baker administration announced a first in the nation order mandating flu shots for most students. Health officials here in Massachusetts say this step is an important one to reduce flu related illnesses in the interest of public health. But it also raises questions about choice and autonomy. As state senator, would you support a similar mandate for Massachusetts residents to receive a COVID-19 vaccine if it becomes available? Mr. Pierce, you'll answer first. I think that it should definitely be voluntary. I don't think that the Commonwealth or even the federal government should try and demand or tell people what they should do with their bodies, just like women have a right to choose. Men do too about putting needles in their arm. Um, and so that actually would lead towards the issue of safe injection sites and making sure that the vaccine is actually a vaccine. It's not introducing some RFID chip or some other idea that some uh, of our uh, people on the extreme right have introduced because this is actually happening in other states. So it's not like uh, we're just envisioning what could or couldn't happen. We need to make sure we have the right leadership needs to make sure that our human rights are upheld because Boston is actually a human rights city. And a lot of people don't know that we have 30 human rights uh, because we don't teach it in our schools. But this is actually a wonderful time to learn about the birthplace of America and why I'm running for office. Because never before do we actually have a champion and someone who would actually defend our country, our nation, and our commonwealth before. And that's why I'm running. My name is Samuel Pierce. Thank you. Senator Collins, the same question to you. Yes, no, I think given what's been before us, we're now in a situation where students can't go back to school. Um, we're not sure when a significant segment of our economy is coming back, which is the tourism and hospitality industry, which funds a significant part of our resources across the state uh, through sales tax and meals tax. And, um, you know, I, I think that when you're looking at a district like the first Suffolk that has suffered such disparities that I would support that. Um, and, and I think that, you know, that falls in line with some other uh, piece of legislation that we've been uh, deliberating this session on vaccines. And there was a lot of pushback from religious advocates um, about having religious exemption that we're, we're trying to work through, whether it's an opt-out for a parent um, that is having a really difficult time with that. But I think on the whole, you know, we're, we're trying to look out for the greater good as it relates to the impacts of these infectious diseases. And we need to be really thinking about everybody, particularly when we have a school system with 50,000 uh, young school children. Um, and so, you know, I think the, you, the, the governors obviously get some pushback and we have in the legislature on a similar issue. But I think given what we've seen, and that's why I was the first uh, elected official to call for, um, for not just free PPE, but statewide um, in, in communities that have been uh, disproportionately impact free COVID-19 testing, work with the city. We got most of my health centers stood up, but I call for the National Guard to use their resources. I know the governor's recently uh, made an announcement um, towards that end. Uh, I mean, just on the, on the commuter rail, no part of the commuter rail is electric at this point. Uh, they all run through the city to the suburbs. So getting the Fairmont line electric would be uh, significant and groundbreaking. So I'm very proud of that. I guess the comparison to the green line would be the red line, which is all electric is a in, in the inner subway system uh, for the city. And I'm sorry, sir, before we move on, did you say yes or no, the vaccine should be mandatory? 
Uh, yes. Thank you. On the topic of housing, Governor Baker has extended the state's eviction moratorium until October 17th. That's assuming that it withstands legal challenges from landlords who say they need to be paid for the housing that they provide. Um, either way, both landlord groups and housing advocates say that when this order lifts, a flood of evictions is expected to put renters at risk of losing their homes. As state senator, what ideas or legislation would you support to help landlords pay their bills and keep renters in their homes? Senator Collins, I believe you answer first. Oh, thank you. No, I think we should have extend the eviction moratorium. I was supportive of that. Um, working on a piece of legislation uh, for right to counsel so that all tenants have a right to counsel. Um, and particularly now, in, in any circumstance, but particularly now we're seeing, as you mentioned, how many people maybe um, looking at eviction post uh, COVID-19. Um, I think there are ways uh, to bring savings to um, property owners to allow them to share that with their tenants to absorb uh, those uh, those hits, so to speak. And I think that can be done both at the local level um, and the state level. You know, we have we have expanded programs uh, to support renters for rental assistance through our voucher programs. Uh, clearly not enough, but giving the municipalities the flexibility uh, to um, to to pass down savings on real estate taxes to the landlord if they're, that's gonna be used to provide relief uh, to those uh, renters that are in um, difficult uh, circumstance, along with our CPA funds. Um, the Community Preservation Act uh, brings in resources to uh, put towards community preservation, historical preservation um, and housing. And I think that uh, those resources can and should be used to support our uh, renters that are struggling um, now more than ever, we, we see the, the need for those resources. Uh, and that's also why I'm, I'm um, pushing legislation, formal petitions by the city of Boston to increase linkage funding uh, that's generated by commercial developments in the city, as well as um, uh, the IDP uh, um, policy for the city of Boston, giving them flexibility to increase the amount of affordable housing units that are built, along with the um, disposition of public land for affordable housing. This is not just a short-term challenge that we need to meet but also long-term as it relates to our housing equity. Thank you, Mr. Pierce. Same question to you. As state senator, what ideas or legislation would you support to help landlords pay their bills and keep renters in their homes? First of all, I actually have a problem with um, the senator saying he would make vaccines mandatory because a lot of our low-income community live in public housing. So by making the vaccine mandatory, now all of a sudden you have a police state forcing people to have needles in their arms, being vaccinated, almost like a movie. So what I would do differently is I would have a home rule petition that would allow for rent control. I would allow for the um, oversight committee for uh, police oversight to be the 14 because there are 14 counties in Massachusetts. So the math works, it can't be six or nine or 12. So each county would know just like they have a, a sheriff or they have a, uh, a governor's counselor, they could actually go to their county uh, oversight commission for the police and there'll be 14 of them. The other thing I would do is I would make sure that we have rent to own housing, like I mentioned. So our section eight vouchers are not just going to in the wind, they're actually going to people that want to better themselves, they can start rent to own housing. And we have a lot of uh, wasteful spending. I'm all for helping our homeless, but right now we have homeless in hotels and we're paying 2,800 to $3,000 a week. And these people could be having places that they can live each month. And instead of helping one individual, or one family, we could be helping multiple individuals and multiple families. And part of it is really looking at the budget, looking at the allocation. Um, for example, uh, looking at the overtime that has been spent uh, on the police and why I actually do uh, support eliminating qualified immunity, mainly because um, $80 million could actually be respent, even if it was repurposed on making sure there are more tutors so for our remote learning. Um, and so I'm really excited about uh, making sure that our housing actually comes with language learners and maybe uh, a computer laboratory. So 
if you're in a low income facility or you're in public housing, you have access to a computer, especially uh, during COVID-19 and, and opening uh, remotely. Mr. How are our children going to be doing that? You'll answer the next question first, and this is actually specifically for you. Um, you haven't filed with the state's Office of Campaign and Political Finance, which keeps and publishes financial disclosure records for candidates and political committees as required by law. Are you raising money for your campaign? And if so, why haven't you filed? I'm glad you asked that question. So by law, if you're raising money, you do have to file. I actually told the uh, Office of Campaign Finance form multiple times that I was not uh, raising money. They were actually closed since March. So during COVID-19, I didn't have any access. I asked them multiple times. I had multiple emails actually requesting. So now it's actually libel and slander because they're making it sound as if I never contacted them. I actually had a uh, advocate and an agent and they were the ones who um, went on vacation. So they're not, they weren't responding to me. They weren't open for months. And now all of a sudden at the very end of the election, they're trying to pull this baloney. So the reality is that I have self-funded myself so I wouldn't be in debt to any special interest group. And unlike my opponent who is a career politician and you know, son of a politician, a lot of the issues that you now see before us really date back. When we look at Jack Hart, when we look at Steve Lynch who used to also be uh, a state senator in this very seat, they were very different than what I would do because they're talking about linkage funds but you've known about this district your whole lifetime. And now all of a sudden you wanna help people of color? I, I disagree. So I, from the very beginning, I would ensure that the linkage funds in South Boston, these billion dollar high rises, make sure that we finally get a high school in Mattapan. We don't have a public high school in Mattapan. Make sure we have a restaurant in Mattapan Square. Make sure that we actually have liquor licenses because they all went to South Boston and building up the restaurants. And I would actually make sure that the city is connected because people actually enjoy the city. It should be one Boston. There shouldn't be health disparities where the life expectancy in Dorchester is 57 and then downtown, you know, the South End and over in South Boston, it's 90. And you look at Mel King. Time as, is running down. I just want to clarify before we move on. Are you raising money for this campaign or no? I just said I was not. I'm actually self-funding myself. Um, and so people would have to donate to my campaign after I won the election. Senator Collins, I'm going to give you a chance to respond here with a bit of a different question uh, based on a quick analysis of your campaign contributions just from this year but slightly more than half your money comes from sources outside of Boston. Should your constituents be concerned about any divided loyalties while you're legislating on Beacon Hill? I think if you look at my record, um, there's probably no one who can say with a straight face that I don't give seven days a week district, um, you know, with strong constituent services um, in that, you know, the, the district owns my vote and, and I'm proud of that. So. Uh, anyone who suggests otherwise is you know, totally wrong. But um, about the linkage, if you look at where linkage has gone quarterly uh, through the city of Boston's housing trust, where it's been generated in South Boston, the South Boston waterfront, um, some of the highest beneficiaries are Hyde Park, Dorchester, and Mattapan. Uh, very proud of that. And just since my time in the Senate, uh, some of the most highest yield pieces of property in the South Boston waterfront have gone to black ownership, whether it's the Omni Hotel project, at the Massport development at Summer and D Street, whether it's the new uh, proposal before uh, Massport uh, for the parcel at Congress Street uh, and B Street, uh, B Street extension, or the UMass Boston Bayside uh, proposal. Um, three uh, uh, large pieces of property, as well as uh, the Convention Center's future real estate portfolio. Um, I have a piece of legislation in the Economic Development Committee bill that would mandate um, uh, ownership uh, being um, diverse. So all things being equal, the most diverse equity team gets the land disposition. Uh, so very proud of that. And it just as it relates to the, uh, the vaccine, I mean, anything, any vaccines are delivered in coordination with people's healthcare providers. So healthcare coverage is free to those who can't afford it. Um, and one of the things that I've spent a lot of time trying to work on with the state and, you know, trying to push contact tracers and other partners with the city and the state to do is to sign up the people that do not have health insurance. Right now we have 25,000 people in the city of Boston 
uh, who do not have healthcare coverage that should have it on 200,000 statewide. Uh, so trying to use the efforts towards uh, contact tracing and um, other efforts around testing for COVID-19 to close that gap. Uh, so uh, I think that you know is how I view the, the issue around um, the vaccine and, and how we're trying to close the gap on, on healthcare disparities. Well, first thing we'd have to do to close the gap on healthcare disparities is make sure that we don't peers. healthcare. And that was one of the things that my opponent- We're moving on to the top of the job. Uh, uh, since 2006 was, was across the board for everybody. So, well, so. if you're actually- Gentlemen, we are not going back and forth on this call. Okay, well, he said he's mandating vaccines. And so that doesn't sound like healthcare for all to me. Because I certainly am not going to let anyone make me get a vaccine that I don't want to get. And that's just me. And We're I have a host. On to the topic that. of jobs and equity. This question comes from Priscilla, who is concerned about trade unions. She asks, how can we get trade unions to release membership data related to women and people of color and Boston residents? Senator Cox, I believe you go first. Uh, as a private organization, I'm not sure. Um, I'm not sure. I mean, we'd have to pu push legislation to see, but I don't know if that's uh, constitutional unless it's on public projects, but possibly if they require public permitting. Uh, so that's something I'd have to look into in terms of releasing data. One thing that I can say that I've been working towards that I think would change the game so we can guarantee jobs through our vocational schools is I would decentralize uh, the, the, the construction trades through our high schools like it once was. Um, and so every high school would have access to, to trades, not just folk, not just excuse me, Madison Park. I've worked to set up partnerships with employers already at Madison Park on building engineering, um, working with contractors right now. But the biggest key is to allow students to get time towards their apprenticeship while they're in high school. So they're not waiting at 18 to begin that, which has them at the back of the bench waiting to get on jobs. So the biggest change that I think needs to happen is to give uh, both um, the children that are at uh, Madison Park, time towards their apprenticeship um, at age 16 and decentralize that so it's across the city. So it's not just Madison Park that has access to the construction trades. I think we could uh, put every kid that graduates from uh, vocational training in our city um, to work for the next 10 years, just off what we know is coming through the pipeline. And, and that's what I'm working towards. As it relates to the, 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 the data collection, I'd have to try to understand with a legal counsel what's um, constitutional, but I would push for that uh, for that data on projects in the city, much like we're pushing for uh, the Boston residency jobs policy to be the law of the land on all state projects in the city, which right now are exempt. Mr. Pierce, same question to you. Well, I actually would be in a unique position because I wouldn't owe anybody any favors. It's very interesting to me to hear people like my opponent who is endorsed by all the unions, but somehow has no idea how to work with them. And so the first thing I would do is I would say, before you endorse me, understand that I support people in schools like People's Academy with T. Michael Thomas. I support Madison Park, but I am support making sure that the kids are actually learning something. And we go back to S27 because we can have as many vocational schools as we want. If 39% of our foster school children are on drugs and their behavioral medication, they're not gonna be learning very much. If 19% of our Boston public school children are on special medication and they're taking drugs, they're not gonna learn very much. And now that my opponent has said, he's gonna mandate you to take a vaccine, what happens if it's a bad vaccine? And my aunt was actually the head of the NIH, Dr. Vivian Penn. And I actually would not allow to have any mandated vaccines because they haven't been tested properly. And I think my opponent is completely wrong on this issue. We're out of time. We want to ask both of the candidates to take a minute to give any concluding remarks before we wrap up. Mr. Pierce, you'll go first. One minute. First thing I want to just remind everyone is that 60 years ago, Dr. King himself came to Boston, Massachusetts to learn not only what America was about, but he also wanted to get his doctorate degree, just like any other student but we weren't able to retain him mainly because the housing was too expensive. So he marched through our city talking about housing, education and jobs. And now 60 years later, we're still talking about housing, education and jobs because people have segregated our schools. 
People are drugging our children. They're trying to mandate vaccines. And we actually need a completely fresh look. Clearly, there's a difference between me and my opponent because with qualified immunity, these police could shove a needle in your neck and there wouldn't be anything you could do about it. I actually would defend the people and make sure that they actually do have an advocate, someone that they can depend upon if they call and they're going through some type of problem and they're not just gonna look the other way and pretend that they don't know how to work with the unions if the unions have already endorsed them. I would talk to my friends. If I have a friend with the union, I would celebrate that. I'd talk to Lou over at 103 and talk to IBEW. Talk about retrofitting our train signals because we're actually running. Time is up. No problem. Senator Collins, you have one minute for final remarks. Uh, despite um, you know some misinformation here by my opponent, I'm proud of my record on uh, on equity and, quite frankly, my families uh, both during uh, the years of desegregation of our schools on the right side of history there, both in South Boston and Charlestown, my mother and father, um, and the work that I've done, about, not just in the House, but in the Senate, particularly around economic empowerment. Um, and, and as it relates to you know issues around, the question was about what can you do to, to get data out of unions? They're not gonna give it, a, no organization would give that away uh, publicly freely. I would imagine it would require legislation. So that's something we would have to look into. That, that's all I was saying. Um, but again, as it relates to um, the issues around economic justice, social economic justice. If you look at my record, uh, and, and not just my record in legislation, my interventions, whether it was the MFA uh, incident with the students um, in last May, um, around um, uh, the Hollywood production that was uh, deseg that was uh, segregating writers, and uh, my intervention there, uh, or you know, as it relates to the work that we've done towards us with our schools, and not just during Chapter Seven reform, but right now. Uh, through, through COVID-19 to support their out-of-classroom learning. Um, you'll see someone who I think is committed to the people all across this district. Um, and I just you know, would ask that they give me consideration for two more years uh, to consider that work. And the, you know, very uh, committed to constituent services. Um, and you know, just in this uh, period alone, we've helped thousands of people get unemployment that, that, uh, that have had trouble along with other state services. So very proud of that track record and uh, looking forward uh, to another two years if the, the people give me a chance. Thank you so much. That concludes the Fairmount Indigo CDC Collaborative's first Suffolk Senate District Candidates Forum. Thank you again to everyone tuning in through your devices at home or wherever you are safely socially distancing. Uh, we're putting up some contact info in case you are interested in joining uh, with Saba Ijadi <laughs> with the um, Climate Justice Initiative. Um, and just another reminder, whoever you decide your day to vote in the state primaries is next Tuesday, September 1st. After that, election day is Tuesday, November 3rd. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for having me. All right, thank you everybody. I'm gonna go ahead and end the meeting now. Um, the recording will be available uh, both on WGBH's forum network page um, and I'll also be sending out links to watch that um, that you can share. Uh, so thank you again for joining us.